Today we are looking at the concluding part of section two of the Heidelberg Catechism, the section that we've been looking at for a number of weeks now, dealing with the topic of salvation, what it looks like for us to experience the grace of God in our lives. And this concluding section deals with the topic of church discipline and the importance of preaching the word. Lord's Day 31, question and answer 83. The preaching of the Holy Gospel and Christian discipline toward repentance. Both preaching and discipline open the kingdom of heaven to believers and close it to unbelievers. Question and answer 84. How does preaching the gospel open and close the kingdom of heaven? Answer. According to the command of Christ. The kingdom of heaven is open by proclaiming and publicly declaring to all believers, each and every one, that as often as they accept the gospel promise in true faith, God, because of what Christ has done, truly forgives all their sins. The kingdom of heaven is closed, however, by proclaiming and publicly declaring to believers and hypocrites that, as long as they do not repent, the anger of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. God's judgment, both in this life and in the life to come, is based on his gospel testimony. Question and answer 85. How is the kingdom of heaven closed and open by Christian discipline? According to the command of Christ, those who, though called Christians, profess unchristian teachings or live unchristian lives, and after repeated and loving counsel refuse to abandon their errors and wickedness, and after being reported to the church, that is, to its officers, fail to respond also to their admonition, such persons the officers exclude from Christian fellowship by withholding the sacraments from them, and God himself excludes them from the kingdom of Christ. Such persons, when promising and demonstrating genuine reform, are received again as members of Christ and of his church. The thing that stands out for many people in the selection of the Heidelberg Catechism is its discussion of Christian discipline in question and answer 85. Discipline is not a tremendously popular topic in today's world. People don't generally like being told what to do, and church discipline has been painted by many as nothing more than misguided crusades, medieval inquisitions, and colonial witch hunts. I guess it shouldn't surprise us. At a time when our society isn't crazy about teachers disciplining students, and sometimes isn't even sure about parental discipline, we shouldn't be startled to know that church discipline is out of favor in seeker sensitivity, tolerance, diversity, and understanding. Yet we believe that the Bible teaches that church discipline is something required of us as Christians. Paul instructs the Thessalonians to take special note of anyone who does not listen to or obey the instruction he gives. He writes to the Corinthians, expel the wicked from among you, quoting the Old Testament. God's people are to be set apart, different, pure. Now, of course, before we decide that no elders meeting is complete unless there have been at least three or four excommunications, we should also note that this is a process, not a goal. The same instruction Paul gives to the Thessalonians also includes the advice, yet do not regard this person as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. To the Corinthians, Paul would later say about someone expelled from fellowship, Reaffirm your love for him. Jesus' own instructions in Matthew 18, to quit which the process in question and answer 85 especially refers, says that discipline is for the correction of faults and the restoration of relationships broken by sin. The purpose is not to enforce a uniform standard on everyone. In other words, the goal of discipline is discipling, helping one another to live out the faith that we claim as followers of Jesus Christ. Church discipline is a pretty big challenge, though, if we don't know why we do it. Our goal is not just to get people to behave, but to think about their lives from a gospel perspective. And so we have to make sure that our churches have lively biblical preaching that challenges hearers to faith in Christ and warns those whose lives do not reflect the gospel message of God's judgment on sin. Too often today, churches and Christians find it easier to swallow without discernment the worldview of Western society that says, well, as long as no one gets hurt, it doesn't matter what you do or what you believe. It's countercultural today to proclaim what the Bible teaches, that whoever believes in Jesus the Son has life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. It's countercultural, but it's biblical. Only Jesus saves, and only those who truly belong to him will want to live for him. Like a diagnosis that offers a treatment for disease, this is not bad news, but good. Sinners who belong to Christ no longer live under a death sentence, but they live in the assurance that heaven is open to them by Christ's finished work.